So hello and welcome back. Today we'll be talking about the Chicago Northwestern Twin Cities 400, which um, is going to kind of break the pattern a little bit here and start the rough transition into the Twin Cities Chicago routes. But the Chicago and Northwestern, um, their famous trains are the 400s. I will do a probably bigger roundup on some of the other 400 trains in a later video at some point, um, probably. I have no idea when, but it's, again, not on the drawing board yet, but there are other things on the drawing board. So anyways, the Chicago and Northwestern was one of the other Granger routes and probably one of the other more famous ones that served the American Midwest by, as mentioned in previous videos, or will future videos, rather. I don't know where I exactly am on the timeline as to where I'm going to put these up, but I'm kind of making these all in one giant batch. Anywho, um, they were there to connect farmers and small towns to larger markets and bridging the gap between the Eastern and Western railroads. The Chicago and Northwestern was among peers like the Burlington, the Rock Island, the Milwaukee Road, and um, a few smaller players, but those were the other three big ones. But it was one of the first Grangers and an early contemporary of the Rock Island. The Chicago Northwestern became the first railroad to make it to Omaha, which gave it access to through freight from the Union Pacific, which is... Um, one of the main reasons why it survived as long as it did, along with its connection to the Powder River Basin, which was originally built as a failed attempt to reach the Pacific Ocean. But the most remembered passenger train of the Chicago Northwestern was its famed but modest Twin Cities 400. Before we get into the Twin Cities 400 itself, we need to talk a bit about the early days of the Chicago Northwestern. Um, I'm going to violate a little bit my rule of not talking about the wherever and wherever and eastern railways that got consolidated into forming the Chicago Northwestern. Um, that did happen, but I am going to go a little bit into the history of that with the Chicago Northwestern so I can do a thing where I basically fulfill every single one of them by describing that here. So the Chicago Northwestern started out as a railway named the Galena and Chicago Union Railroad, which was originally chartered to run to Galena, Illinois. This railroad had ambitious leadership, and it continued to expand across the Midwest, eventually gaining control of a railroad chartered to run to Clinton, Illinois, and on to Omaha to meet the Pacific Railroad, which it did in 1867 and beating the Rock Island, as I mentioned in the last video, which owned the first railway actually chartered to go to Omaha from the Mississippi River. And um, this was also, again, a little, the Rock Island was chartered to go there before it was known that it would be the end of the Pacific Railroad, whereas the Chicago Northwestern got there after it knew. And um, the UP, and the Rock Island actually made it like literally a couple weeks before the UP commenced transcontinental operations. Anyways, the Chicago Northwestern, or at least its predecessor, didn't start stop there. Over the course of the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, it gobbled up railroads across the Midwest, including railroads like the Chicago, St. Paul, and Fond du Lac Railroad, the Omaha Line, and others, which allowed it to crisscross Minnesota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Michigan's Upper Peninsula. In 1886, the Chicago and Northwestern started building what it termed the Cowboy Line, which would extend across the northern edge of Nebraska and eventually make it as far west as Casper, Wyoming. And as mentioned in the Railroad Vacations video, this is where the Chicago and Northwestern would run its Yellowstone train and connect passengers to Yellowstone via a bus. It would also always be the smaller of the four railroads to connect to Yellowstone. The UP had the strongest business following, followed by the Northern Pacific and the Milwaukee Road for Yellowstone. But anyways, the Cowboy Line, although never reaching the Pacific Ocean like it was planned, um, did serve as a vital link. Into, in the Chicago Northwestern system until it was regulated as a secondary system and basically a long branch line until the rise of the Powder River Basin coal mines. But it still did do a lot of uh, business. And in the 1930s, um, the Nebraska Parks and Game Commission noted that there were 66 farm dealers, 117 coal, farmer, coal dealers, 48 green elevators, 55 lumber dealers, and 120 eight gas and oil receivers along the cowboy line, which I'm, for full disclosure, I'm not sure if that's the entire line or just the Nebraska part of it. And if it's just the Nebraska part of it, that is still a very substantial sum of business for what it, they considered a branch line. Other extensions in the region took it as far as Rapid City, South Dakota, both across South Dakota and with a link up to Rapid City from the UP and Nebraska. But back to um, its early, early history rather than going into the weeds on that one. In 1855, um, this would be one of the most important years for the Chicago Northwestern. This is when the Chicago, St. Paul, and Fond du Lac merged with a bunch of other railroads, which after 
bankruptcy was formally reorganized into the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. That would be known through history. And in 1859 is when a man named William Ogden came into the picture and reorganized the bankrupt cartel of railroads into um, one firm and put it on a firm footing. And this was through filling in gaps um, in the railroad service area, building branch lines connecting to the Upper Peninsula through Green Bay. Ogden also saw the burgeoning Rock Island, Burlington, and Milwaukee Road as the railroads that they would be needing to compete with the most. And if he led his guard town, they would easily overtake the Chicago Northwestern. And under his leadership is when the Galena um, and Chicago Union Railway was formally absorbed into the Chicago Northwestern in 1865. And the Chicago Northwestern just continued its march across the U.S. Ogden and his successor saw expansion as the only way to ward off competitors, which is a strategy it followed until it had a dense web of feeder lines in the upper Midwest. It did eventually reverse course in the 70s after deregulation started, and it went through a period of consolidation and retrenchment with it surviving even even as a smaller railroad and um, survived even as some of its competitors basically collapsed. At this time, it did become an employee-owned company and was focused, focusing all its resources on preserving its still profitable main lines and few remaining profitable feeder routes along with its connection to the Powder River Basin. But a brief history of the Chicago Northwestern and its octopusing across the country. Um, the first main train on the Chicago Twin Cities line was the Northwest Limited or Northwestern Limited, excuse me, which was a heavyweight Pullman train that could be one of the most luxurious trains the Chicago Northwestern would ever um, run, or at least arguably was. This train had reclining coach seat cars, a diner, a lounge, sleepers, and a lounge with a nice big windows that were like a sunroom, which also I believe had a couple additional bedrooms. And this train was re-equipped twice in the 1920s and eventually ended up ended by the launch of the Twin Cities 400, or at least it's position as being the best and most respected Chicago Northwestern train. As time went on though, the train was cut back and canceled just like um, every other train in the U.S. was doing, but we'll um, save the, as is tradition, save the decline and depressing um, pre-Amtrak bits for later in the video. The Twin Cities 400 was launched after seeing the Burlington launch its first Zephyr and the Milwaukee Road following up with the Twin Cities Hiawatha, or at least it was, the Milwaukee Road didn't really announce what it was doing yet, but it was, it knew it was, they knew they were scheming up something. The Chicago Northwestern launched its original 400 train using steam engines and leftover heavyweight cars in an attempt to match the level of service offered by its competitors, running service to the Twin Cities. The first service was run in 1935, and the train proved so popular that it was pretty much immediately re-equipped with diesel engines and streamlined equipment in 1939, or at least that's when the equipment was formally put into service. Also, I have to note around the same time, the Northwest Limited was also starting to get new equipment. The Twin Cities 400 was the first in, as I mentioned, a series of trains called the 400, and um, I will be going into those in a separate video because there are a bunch of them that are relatively, I guess, unimportant is the only nice way to put it, but I wouldn't say unimportant, but not as well recorded, maybe, is a nicer way to put that. The Twin Cities 400 was the first in the fleet and, as mentioned, was part of the, you know, series. The 400 name was chosen because it was able to travel 400 miles in 400 minutes. And um, this is also why the Twin Cities became a daytime train. And um, also I have to mention that the Northwest Limited was an overnight train at this point, which ran on a 12-hour schedule, and the Twin Cities 400 ran on a 7-hour daytime schedule. As the train was upgraded, it was um, painted into the famous yellow and green that the Chicago Northwestern passenger trains would eventually become known for. This re-equipping um, ended up adding newer chair cars, a diner, a parlor car with private rooms, a tavern lounge, and a lounge observation bar car. This again, like the Rock Island Rockets, was very much in the same branch of train family tree as an Amtrak state-supported service would be today. I know that shorter Amtrak trains don't have private rooms or dining cars, but over time these tended to be short-lived and also it was kind of a technological limitation. They didn't really have like a head and power and microwaves yet in the 1930s, so they kind of had to have, and they also were regulated into having higher service, and these were also more first-class trains, but again, same branch of the tree, even if they're not like a one-to-one -one comparison. Anyways, 
the Chicago Northwestern eventually gave up on the Twin Cities 400 because it was having a hard time competing against the Milwaukee Road's Twin City Hiawatha. And according to a report on streamlined pasture trains in 1938, at least, at least I think it's 1938, it could be 39, I'm not really sure. Actually, it might be a little later because the re-equipping was in 1938. The Twin Cities 400 carried about half the passengers the Zephyrs and the Hiawathas did and earned about a third of the net revenue. And this would come after a period of decline in their passenger services. So I do think it was like later in the 40s. So as time wore on, the Chicago and Northwestern started to replace their passenger cars with the Pullman bi-levels, um, whose successors still run on Metro today. And uh, although these cars were said to be used to increase ridership, this was really just a means of saving money on their operations. Their employees once said that CNW actually stood for cheap and nothing wasted. So the Chicago and Northwestern would uh, do anything to save a buck, even if it's using 50-year-old diesel engines well into the 90s among the cost-saving measures that the Chicago and Northwestern would do in the 1950s was being a pioneer of push-pull operations on its passenger trains, which is where the high levels um, came into existence. And they were also one of the first railways to switch over, I think, entirely to head-in power. And as mentioned in several past videos, the switch was also because they of how they expected the passenger industry. You know, right, I'll, I, I explained the, the head-in power thing in the past video that it actually is more efficient. But they did the switch because they expected the passenger industry to go in a certain direction. And this was that inner city trains would eventually be die off to be replaced with commuter and like regional suburban services. So the inner city trains were getting the bi-level cars because they could just shuffle them onto commuter trains around Chicago. And um, they didn't want to basically buy new cars that were not going to be useful basically after the mid 60s. It was I guessing is where they kind of considered pasture trains would be dead. Which they weren't really that wrong. I mean, by 71, they weren't didn't have any pasture trains anymore. Anyways. As time wore on, the Chicago and Northwestern did cut back its pasture network. The Northwest Limited was cut in the mid-50s due to a falling ridership, but this was after um, its 1955 high point. The high point was getting the, uh, the Chicago Northwestern's contribution to the city fleet assigned to the Northwestern and other secondary passenger trains throughout the system, but this high point was very short-lived. Most of the secondary passenger trains were eliminated by the 60s, and the Northwestern Limited was cut in the summer of 1959 along with 14 other trains, and the quick replacement of its regular trains with bi-level cars in the following years. So in 1970, the Chicago Northwestern, in, a, in its grand tradition of being cheap, did join Amtrak. And on April 30th, 1971, the remaining trains ran for the last time. And as far as I can tell, none of their trains that were retained by Amtrak. Although there are still plans to restart um, service in Wisconsin to Green Bay along the old, I believe it's the Chicago Northwestern Main Line. I'm not entirely sure. It actually might be the Milwaukee Road Line. I'm not like 100% sure where their um, tracks are since I don't live in that part of the country. And I'm uh, sometimes looking at old math. It's kind of hard to tell even if where they were since they had overlapping services. And um, there's also, at one point, um, there was plans, as I mentioned in the Rock Island video, to use the Chicago Northwestern to restart the Peoria rocket in the mid-70s, which nothing came of. And Amtrak to this day still doesn't run anything over the old Chicago Northwestern. But I do think their 2035 plan includes adding service between the Twin Cities and um, Chicago, at least partially over the Chicago Northwestern line in Wisconsin because um, it is part of their 2035 plan. I think, what is it? I um, can't remember which city it is. Hopefully I'll just pop the map up. It's um, Al Claire, I believe is the name of the city or how you pronounce that. I don't know. I believe that's the one where they're gonna, that's the Chicago Northwestern line where they're gonna be hopefully someday maybe if things, if the stars align and the infinite powers of Christ beam down on us, we'll get a new train. One last fun note, at least fun note that I found interesting before I completely sign off here or ramble long about a train that may or may not ever exist in America is that the Chicago Northwestern was actually one of the few if only left-hand running railroads in the United States, meaning that the trains were driven on the left-hand side of the track instead of the right-hand side. When the Chicago Northwestern built its main lines, they put all of their stations on the left-hand side relative to Chicago-bound trains. When some main lines were double-tracked, the outbound track, which was leaving Chicago, because Chicago um, kind of worked like the SP and they're fluxing, pushing everything into San Francisco. Anyways, the they put the outbound tract or what, what became the outbound tract on the outside of the existing track instead of, um, 
you know, on the other side. They did this for the sake of, you know, not having to move the station or um, messing with the existing track as they're cheap. And this is um, unusual in the U.S. since we drive on the right-hand side of the road and the only railroads in the world that tend to have left-hand running were built by British companies, of which U.S. railroads were notoriously not built by the Brits. So... Even to this day, the Chicago and Northwestern parts of the UP system are still in left-hand operation because it's too expensive to redo all the signals across the old system to um, switch it over to right-hand running, which I'm going to guess means that trains running between Omaha and Council Bluffs have to like switch sides of the tracks to um, cross between the two. So that's just an interesting little tidbit. Then I'm going to end this here. Um disclaimer or ad I guess at the end of this video is that I am going to do a longer well there's your problem style podcast show episode thing if they ever see this sorry I'm ripping you off but it's going to be about the rise and fall and issues with the Granger railways and why at least the Milwaukee Road and Rock Island failed at least in partially my opinion and partially with how their history unfolded I also will be doing um Twin Cities Chicago trains over the next couple weeks. Um, hopefully the the Granger one will come out sometime either late September, early October. As of recording this episode, I have actually not even started recording it. So yeah, no idea when exactly that's going to be uh, kicked out. So <laughs> hopefully you do stay tuned for that. And um, until then, I will see you in the next video. And uh, do the like, share, subscribing, tell me how... Um, horrible I am at making these because I talk too fast or something, but yeah, we'll uh, see you in the next one. <laughs>